today's top story from the perspective of someone who's there. You are looking live. This just in. Not my beat. That's right. We're welcoming in the birthday boy, Sam Fortier. Uh, birth- when is the actual day uh, that, we- that we're celebrating here? I know it's this week, but when, when is the actual birthday? Wow, this is uh, quite a way to come onto the show. I appreciate you. I appreciate Ann for playing that. Uh, the actual day is Friday. Okay, there you go. So I'm very sad that I will be out of town and unable to celebrate with you guys. But uh, we will send you the best wishes uh, from from South Carolina, where we'll be, and we'll certainly uh, the wife and I, uh, who Sam Sam does actually know my wife. Uh, we will we will celebrate you properly when we return. That is a promise. I appreciate that. We'll definitely have to get it together. Excellent. Um, So I want to do two kind of big things topic-wise for you today. One is your birthday. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, One is talking about draft charts um, because you have actually studied these and they've become a big deal, uh, not only with the Sam Howell trade, but the like. what would it actually look like if the Vikings wanted to offer a war chest? Like, how how do the picks match up? So I want to go into that. And then I want to get to the article that you wrote uh, that that just came out uh, for the post. Uh, Sam wrote a great article inside Adam Peters team building strategy and roster building strategy. Uh, so we'll get to that in a second, but let's start with the draft charts. Like when do these draft charts start and how have they evolved over the years that these teams are still using versions of them to make these deals? So I, I appreciate you having me on to talk about maybe the nerdiest thing that I do. And that's a, that's a competitive list. That is, um, that is a hell of a list. <laughs> but I, I love talking about draft charts. I love figuring them out. So, I mean, look like, Basically, draft charts try to quantify the value of each draft pick. And the history of this starts in, like, 1991. There's a petroleum engineer named Mike McCoy in the Dallas Cowboys facility. Uh, It's right when Jerry Jones buys the team, hires Jimmy Johnson, and they're like, hey, how do we, as new guys, start getting, you know, basically getting an edge on these guys who have been in the league forever? So they start by basically creating the Jimmy Johnson graphic value chart, which has a ton of problems that we can get into if you really want. But basically, like, McCoy looks back at all the trades that have happened over the last five years or something like that, and he starts to, you know, he, he's a mass guy, right? He's a petroleum engineer. He starts to figure out, okay, if I set the, the first value at 3,000, and here's a linear regression, blah, blah, blah. And so basically, over the last 33 years, a bunch of people have tried to improve upon that model. And, and basically what they've found is the Jimmy Johnson model, which is misnamed, misunderstood. It basically has like captured the overconfidence of those executives in the eighties that they were going to pick the best player out of all the players. And, and basically what they've figured out the newer charts is that the value declines more slowly than Jimmy Johnson would tell you. Basically you don't know as much as you think you do. You don't, you are not as, able or as skilled as you think you are to pick the right player every time. And so what the, the new draft charts tell us is, is basically you're not as smart as you think you are. It's better to have more picks, but it's better to have more higher picks. And, and they all come up with, with different values. Now I know I'm rambling here, but if the Vikings were to trade up with Washington, it's not a thing or, or, or someone else or new England, it wouldn't be a thing where you could look at the chart and say, okay, well, this equals 100, this equals 100, this is the trade. Because when you're going up, particularly for a quarterback, teams are going to charge you premiums. It's never equal. It, so you, you're going to have to pay, you know, probably if, if it was 100, it'd be 110, 120, depending on how competitive um, the trades for those picks are. Now that I've talked for about two minutes, do you want to jump back in and ask me a question? Yeah, no, that sounds good. But that's a great – that you laid a fantastic foundation for me to then uh, – ask you a couple of different questions off of, including a giant strategy question. But let's let's flesh out the charts a little bit more. So just to give people a, a more clear eye on this, like what was, and we just can pick like one example, right? From chart to chart. What did Jimmy Johnson get wrong that these more recent charts have tried to get right? And I think like the mid rounds are a good example of this. And I would, I would say that I don't mean to dump on Jimmy Johnson totally because I think at the time, it, it did what it needed to do, right? It created totally. a currency for a thing that, that people just did not have, um, you know, language to express. It was like, hey, you know, if I'm, if I'm trying to get a player from you or if I'm trying to go up, it, it just was a, a cheat sheet basically for an executive to say, how do I not look silly if I'm trying to trade back and, and this team is offering me X and this team is offering me Y? Um, it, what it got wrong basically is, is the confidence that those old time GMs would have about like, uh, I, I looked at this guy, I saw him practice his, his his girlfriend is good looking this guy's gonna be a good player like it basically was like hey 
it, it, you shouldn't be as confident as you think you should be. Um, and so the value, like the value of, of a first round, the, the first pick in the first round is really high, but you know, the, the pick in the middle of the third round is not that much lower. It, it, it's lower for sure by quite a substantial amount, but just not as low as the Jimmy Johnson chart said it was. So that gets to kind of this this philosophical question, and uh, we're going to talk about this more uh, here on the show in the bottom of the or the back half of the hour uh, in our never read the comments section. But people will then take some of that same logic and be like, "Well, then you shouldn't take a quarterback at two because the best quarterbacks wind up uh, being like the eleventh pick with Mahomes, or you know they they have their examples of of plenty of guys who have been successful." Um, later in the draft, they've gone to good situations. They were good players. Scouts missed on them for whatever reason. And I, my counter argument to that is not that like you're wrong because obviously the facts are the facts, but that there's not actually a better place to be like that. You, and we talked about this last time you were on. If you think that you're right at two at quarterback and you think one of these guys is awesome, you don't mess around with the trade. You just take them. So how do we balance those? Like as you talk to executives around the league and scouts who are hoping to be the, the lead executive one day. How do they balance that reality that the charts prove out over time that more swings is better with, hey, man, if you got that number two pick and, and Drake May or Jaden Daniels or whoever is sitting on the board and you really like them, like, you should just take that player? Yeah, so I think that this is a really complicated discussion in which there's a lot of nuance and gray area and like the people who are paid a lot of money to make these decisions and have all of the information, like get it wrong very regularly. Or, you know, in the case of San Francisco, when they go up to get Trey Lance, like just things don't work out for a variety of reasons. Sometimes the player, sometimes the system, sometimes the coaching, like this is just, sometimes it's the market. Like sometimes it's it's an incredibly complicated, nuanced discussion. And I think I have talked about this with, with a guy named Logan Paulson, who you might know. Um, I've heard of him. He's very tall. (laughs) Right. And so, yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he and I have, have talked about actually like there's probably two philosophies here. Um, and, and like when you're talking about Drake Mayer, Jane Daniels, if you're at number two and you think, hey, one of these guys has the potential to be a top 10, top five level quarterback who can go toe to toe with Patrick Mahomes or Josh Allen in a playoff game. If you think it's possible to get one of those players to that ceiling, you have to take them because that is the whole thing, Daniel Jeremiah on a podcast the other day said, like, teams are just in, in the draft looking for a quarterback that will keep them out of the quarterback market for the next 10 to 12 years because it's the hardest thing in the league. No one has the magic sauce. You just have to figure it out. But the other thing that Logan and I talked about, if you do not feel that Drake and Jaden are in the top, you know, it can be a top 5, 10 guy because of whatever flaw that they have. And, and I think that's a reasonable conclusion to come to. I, I think they're both very talented players who would be very good. But if, if Adam Peters is sitting there and says, ah, I don't know, then I think you can trade down and say, okay, we're going to get a game manager quarterback like they had in, in San Francisco. And I don't use that label as, you know, demeaning. But, okay, then we need to go down and get this guy and we need to build the team up around him like they have in San Francisco. So, but, but Adam Peters, I would say that, that if you trade it down, that decision – would be incredibly high stakes because if you move down and some other team like the Vikings go up and they take Drake May or they take Jaden Daniels and then that guy is awesome and he's going to the NFC or AFC championship game every year, then you are going to hear that from your owner, from your fan base forever. And so uh, you probably won't have that job forever. So I would say, you know, those are the kind of the two tracks that I'm thinking about here uh, in terms of Drake May, Jaden Daniels staying at two. Yeah, 100%. So let's combine this conversation a bit and then move on to that bigger roster building question that you wrote about. Sam Fortier from the Washington Post is with us. Like, what does a Minnesota offer do you think realistically look like? Are we talking 11, 23, and two more first rounders? Are we talking one more first rounder? Like, does Washington have to give up anything besides two to quote unquote even it out? Like, what does if if Minnesota is in a in a bidding war and, and decides like we're getting Drake May and they're going to have to be insane to make us say no? What does that kind of offer look like? So the trade charts on this uh, vary by chart, obviously, but I would say at minimum you're going to have two firsts and then like we talked about, right? Like it's it, it, this 
the charts, it's, it's hard to peg what exactly the offer should be because you're not looking for equal value. You're looking for surplus value. And how right. much surplus value you can get depends on how many teams are talking to you. So if the Giants want to move up, you know, it's, oh, okay, then it's like it would have to be even higher because they're in the division in Minnesota. You don't want to go back to 11, but maybe you can then go back up to five or, or seven or, or whatever. So it's, I, I, I want to give you an answer. I think three first round picks, 11, 23, and, and next year would be the starting discussion. But then you have to imagine, you know, are you really comfortable going back to 11? Are you really comfortable? You know, do you think you can move back up? Would you want to move back up? You know, what is, who is the player you would take at 11 or, or what range of players? And so, uh, I, I don't know what the exact offer would be, but it would have to be a lot. I totally agree. And there's acknowledge the risk involved, but also acknowledge that uh, as you and Logan have talked about and Logan and I have talked about um, separately is like, if you don't love one of these guys, that might be a risk you're willing to take. Uh, it just depends because it also affects on how big of a risk you think it is. If you don't think it's that big of a risk to quote unquote downgrade from Drake May to JJ McCarthy and you feel confident about getting McCarthy, uh, or you feel like Jaden's going to drop. I've seen that projected some places too. Like then, then you do it. Okay. Uh, Sam wrote a great piece in the post. Uh, I think it came. I saw it today. Might have come out yesterday. Sorry, I don't check your byline every single day. I'm just such a horrible friend. Uh, but you, uh, you wrote about Adam Peters' roster building strategy and how this year is a bit of a bridge year. What do you mean by that? And I guess more importantly, what does he mean by that? If if people around the building are using that term. I say that he is building a bridge roster, particularly in free agency, because if you look at the way he's approached free agency, despite all of the cap space, the highest base value contract he's given out is three years, 33 million to defensive end Dorrance Armstrong. I think that, you know, when you look at the way that other teams around the league have approached free agency with new GMs, like the Raiders, like the Panthers, those guys have made big splashes and locked in guys, that, you know, are going to be there for maybe the entire GM's tenure. Or they're, they're planning a stake of this is the new era. And, and you think back to 2020 when Ron Rivera signed Kendall Fuller in free agency. Okay, that's a four-year deal. Like, this guy might not be here for all for four years, but we've committed to him to be a big part of this, you know, rebuild. Adam Pierce has not done that. And he has talked about wanting to build through the draft. And obviously he has a lot of draft capital and he's going to be able to do that. But when I look at this free agent roster, I, I look back to it at, at San Francisco in 2017 when Adam was there. He was the VP of player personnel when, when they were rebuilding after a 2-14 and 14 year. They had a very similar approach. A ton of guys, short-term, low-risk contracts. You know, let, let's, get the, let's raise the floor of this roster and figure out who our long-term pieces are in the draft or, or maybe one of these free agent hits like Kyle Juszczyk and, and then he's still there. But if you look at the whole class, only three guys made it at least three seasons. And so to me, I'm looking at this free agent class and thinking the same thing, you know, uh, outside of, you know, Frankie Louvu and Dorrance Armstrong and, and Biotish, the, the center, like uh, a lot of these dudes, even though they've signed 20 of them are probably here today, gone tomorrow or gone next year, you know, a hundred percent. And I think there's also another similarity and I'm going to bring that, that Paulson fellow back into this uh, because he was one of those guys on those contracts in 2017. That was, that was in and out in a year. Um, but they, targeted guys who could reset the culture and or reset the environment, reset the atmosphere, reset the whatever word you want to substitute in for culture because that word has been poisoned now uh, in Washington, D.C. But they, you know, to me, that's like, yeah, Bobby Wagner can still play, but he's also going to be such a professional. Zach Ertz um, is, is going to be this professional, the guys that you look to. And, and I feel like as much as anything, Peters has really nailed that where there's going to be an identity here far that that far outlasts if they do it right and and integrate the locker room properly with the young guys he's about to draft it's far going to outlast the actual players that he signed this offseason 100 percent, and and like he said because really you want to build through the draft it's it's the most economical way it's it's the best way to get guys in your building and develop them and, and having you know bobby wagner or zach Ertz or austin eckler or wh whomever you're drafting like they, this takes the pressure off of them because, oh, you know, you have Zach Ertz who's going to figure out how to get open on third down for this young quarterback. And, like, then, you know, you have, you're not putting pressure on the draft pick that you have or whatever, you know, at the linebacker position, corner position, whatever. And so, to me, like, it really all builds on everything, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, it, it, it totally makes sense, which then leaves, uh, I guess, two big questions that I'd I like to leave you with. Which one is 
then why is there seemingly still a hole at left tackle? It's the one position that they kind of didn't do this at. Like Corn Lucas, I guess, could be that answer, and maybe maybe he is brought, being brought in to start. But it does feel like that's the one position where they still have to come out of the draft, outside of quarterback, obviously, with that. And we'll get to quarterback in a second. But what do you make of that that kind of key cornerstone position not seeming to be a priority of like, we got to use some of this cap space to get one of these dudes in here? Let me let me clarify right up the top of the Cornelius Lucas is not being brought in to start. Um, this is well, a right now they, he's the top guy on the depth chart because they don't have anybody else. <laughs> sure, but this is a strong tackle class. This is a yes. strong, uh, you know, like you are going to even at the end of the first round have starting caliber options. I think, and so um, yeah, I mean, it is a glaring need. Yes, they will have to do it. You know, do they? package their two twos and move up late in the first to get the guy that they want. I think that's possible. But what, I, what I'm saying here is I think that they will have options and you're not going to go into week one of this season with Cornelius Lucas starting at left tackle, even though I feel like I've, I've you know been a little harsh on Cornelius, who I think is a very good swing tackle and can step in at any moment, just not a guy you would want to be a starter for 17 games. Yeah, but if he starts the first month while a young guy's learning, like that's that's fine. Um, and that leads to the same kind of thing at quarterback. Um, I think a lot of people have questions about Mariota. It's the one signing that I think a lot of people are like, wait, him? And they point to Brissett or Tyrod Taylor and some of the other options that were out there. Obviously, the Sam trade plays into this. But what do you make of the Mariota signing and why you think he was either targeted or why they were unable? Like, how much do we know at this point about what, how aggressively they pursued other options? We do know that they, they talked to other people, including Sam Darnold. Uh, but, I mean, they landed on Marcus Mariota, and obviously they have Brian Johnson, the former offensive coordinator in Philly, with, with Mariota last year. I mean, that I would imagine that Brian Johnson was a big part of that because everybody knows that Mariota left Atlanta in 2022 um, after they benched him for Desmond Ritter and, and did not play the role that you would want out of a veteran mentor quarterback. He went to Philly last year. He said all the right things in public. It's, it's very hard to know, you know, what he was like in the meeting room with Jalen Hurts, especially when things were going wrong. But obviously, Brian Johnson felt comfortable enough with him and his behavior there to bring him in. And so I, I would say that is, you know, maybe the first big bet we're seeing from, from Brian Johnson and Adam Peters. Yeah, and it's so funny to me that the the response is often, and I would say fans and media are both guilty of this. Um, we try to be as responsible as we can, but, you know, oh, that guy's so smart when he does the thing that we think he should do, and then it's like, ah, what an idiot, uh, oh, instantly the second he does something else. So it's like, oh, look, Bobby Wagner, Adam Peters is a genius. Marcus Mariota, that guy's an idiot. And, like, it's just, it's, it, it is pure confirmation bias on a scale of whether someone is smart or not. And that is the world that we live in, Sam Fourier. Yeah, I mean, I would say, like, the, the NFL, like, people say it's a week-to-week -week league, right? But, like, and I think that I used to think, oh, that's a cliche that coaches use or players use to, like, dodge meaningful questions. And, nope. and sometimes I still think that's true. But, like, look at Sam Howell. Like, in week 10 last year, we all thought, like, this guy is a, a franchise quarterback. But, you know, it, it, over the larger body of work and over the, you know, situation once you zoom out and see okay like these are the things that were happening you start to realize okay maybe he's not that guy or maybe they don't believe he's that guy or, or uh there are these big red flags including the sacks or whatever so i mean like yes it is always confirmation bias all the time and the best we can do is like try to be aware of it and safeguard against it 100 percent, because we're responsible journalists damn it uh sam 48 washingtonpost.com slash sports you can read the piece on Peters, and uh, if you want all the nerdiness that you can possibly imagine on draft charts, uh, check out his Twitter feed at Sam the number four T R. Uh, again, happy early birthday! Uh, have a great weekend celebrating, and uh, appreciate your time here on the radio, my friend. Thanks, guys. Always appreciate coming on with you. Hey, this is Da, and you're listening to the Hoffman Show on the Team 980 and the Odyssey. Act.